uh, welcome everyone to the WorkTango webinar series. Uh, the topic we're going to be discussing today is how to build a better foundation for employee engagement uh, and changing the social contract with employees as a big part of that. Now, uh, usually we get the question uh, that, you know, will this webinar recording be emailed? And it will be, so you will get access to this. So no need to make all those notes. Uh, you can listen in and, and refer to this a little later. Um, but what we wanted to do before getting started is uh, really just um, introduce the speakers. Um, so you came on here, there were two guys talking about Tahoe and skiing, and uh, you may not know who they are. Uh, but uh, I'll kind of start from, a, from my end, from an introduction. My name is Rob Catalano. I'm uh, the Chief Engagement Officer at a company called Work Tango. Uh, personally, I spent the last maybe 16, 17 years um, helping on whether it's building technology, HR technology companies, or on the consultation or advisory side uh, from an HR perspective, and just something that uh, I'm super passionate about when it comes to this topic about employee engagement. Uh, and we have uh, uh, you know, our guest at Work Tango, Jason Loritzen, who, uh, as you see, is a lot of things there. Keynote speaker, an author, a consultant, an all-around good guy. Um, you know, he wrote a couple of books, which I'm not lying to you on the screen, you see the unlocking high performance in red on the right and social gravity yellow on the left, but they were switched around. And then when we got onto the video, I noticed it was right behind them. So I wanted to get the branding right and put, <laughs> put them on your right side. Um, but without, uh, reading <laughs> some boring, uh, bio Jason of, uh, of you, uh, can you give everyone an understanding of, you know, kind of your story and, and what you're all about? Well, I, uh. I hail from the great state of Nebraska, so uh, greetings from my uh, from the the compound as we call it here in uh, just outside of Omaha. Um, I have been kind of at this work, I guess you know I'm, I'm sort of have been driven to understand the this dynamic between people and work. I think for well over 20 years, my first supervisory job was when I was 13 years old, and it, and and I think I was perplexed from that moment on. I spent a decade as an HR executive. I have spent time working um, within an HR technology um, and research company. I have been a consultant and speaker kind of throughout and have, have been writing about this topic for a long time. And so I'm, a, I'm an employee engagement nerd. Um, I am driven by this kind of core purpose to make work work better for people. I don't think work has to suck and it shouldn't. And so it's kind of me in a nutshell. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. And, uh, you know, we, we, all, you know, we get the opportunity every month with our webinar series to try to have a conversation about something that, you know, obviously we're really passionate about and, and seeing what Jason's done historically, you know, as he mentioned, as an HR leader, um, with a lot of the research he's done in the past and, and what he helps other organizations do on a day-to-day -day basis, we thought, you know, who better to speak to on, on this topic and, and dig a little deeper. So, so Jason, again, thanks for, for being here and be a part of this today. Uh, really excited. For sure. Um, now, one thing I want to mention is this is our agenda for today. Um, you know, the, what we call it is the world is your oyster. So literally, we don't have slides. We don't have a prescribed thing we're going to talk about. Jason and I jumped on about 10 minutes before this call to have a conversation, which I think we mostly spoke about other random things than, uh, than this webinar topic. Um, but this is where we're encouraging a lot of participation here. So... Um, my IRS had loved that. So that's the type of participation. Um, but uh, what we want people to do is uh, be a part of the conversation, uh, leave any comments, um, ask some questions, and, and we're going to see where it goes. I mean, you know, I don't know if this could be awesome. This could be a train wreck. Uh, I think it's going to be awesome. But uh, the idea is to have a conversation about this topic of, again, uh, the world of employee engagement and that social contract. So before I get rid of these slides, um, I did want to share a couple of things. Um, first, uh, on the left-hand side, if you have an issue, you need some help, you have a, you know, something that has nothing to do with the content of the webinar, use the chat function. Um, you see Jason and I on the call. You see another gentleman, Steven. He's uh, one of our Work Tango folks that, again, if anything's coming up, he's there to help you. Um, but on the Q&A side, this is where we'll be monitoring it, right? We'll want to hear, you know, anything that you want to say, uh, any questions you have, and just to get a sense of, you know, learning how to use it. If anyone can just go in and type like, what's one word to describe how you're feeling today? Like go to the Q and A, first find it, where is it? Um, once you pop that up, I just wanna make sure that people know where to go to. So if they have that burning question, they're not you know, searching for this, uh, this thing, <laughs> um, this Q and A like button. It. So busy, engaged, energetic, happy to not be outside, I, I like that, uh, cold. Uh, intrigued. Hi, ah, Marie, we, we're intrigued you. We'll try to help with that. Uh, a lot of cold going on. Happy, trying to do 
trying to sh get shit done, I think that was. All right, Suzanne. Curious, sassy, I like that. Um, there's a lot of good stuff here. Energetic, joyous. Laurel, that's pretty good too. Um, so anyways, uh, you all know where the Q&A is now. You can differentiate it from the chat. Um, and um, someone said Christmassy. All the people that did it in the chat, throw it to the Q&A side because that's the one we're going to looking at a little more. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thanks everyone for participating. I think we have a lot of excited people here, Jason, to talk to, uh, to talk to today. And we got to live up to it now. Yeah, I know. This is way more pressure than I wanted on a you know, Thursday afternoon. Um, so that all being said, everyone, we're going to shut this down here. Uh, I think the slides are gone, right? Awesome. Now you can see us a little, you know, a little clearer and see the books behind Jason that we were referring to if it was a little too small. Um, but, uh, you know, last thing I want to mention, Jason, just introducing yourself before getting into the, the topic and the conversation. Um, what's one thing about you people wouldn't know reading your bio? Like anything, any other hobby, anything you do that's, you know, uh, we, again, we just wouldn't know. Um, well, there's, there's, I guess, a lot of things. I, the, the most interesting, I'm told often that the most interesting thing about me is my wife. Um, <laughs> because she is, a, she is an elected official and she's kind of a... Uh, social advocate is like super involved in changing the world. And so I, I think that's probably the thing that, you know, behind, behind any good man, there's always a better woman. And that is for sure the case in my, in my case. So. Awesome. Cool. We're in All front right, so, of, I should have said, I shouldn't say behind in front of any good man is a better woman. That's what I should have said. All right. You know, this is recorded, right? So I do. <laughs> um, Wonderful. So uh, now we got everyone involved in there. Uh, you know, I don't think some people still joining, but uh, we'll dive right into the content. And, you know, in this topic of, you know, building a better foundation for employee engagement, uh, where I usually like to start is, well, how do you define it? So I'm interested, Jason, all the research, everything you've done, I find that there's always different varying understandings of what it is, but how do you define the world of engagement? Uh, and then we'll dive into some, uh, some of the things more specifically. So I think probably the way that I define it's a little bit different than what you may have heard before. Um, and the, the way, so specifically, I, when I talk about engagement, what I mean is that engagement is the degree to which an employee is willing and able to perform up to their potential. And so let me, let me unpack that for a second. So engagement's a measure, right? And so it's a measurement of something and this degree, you know, so it's degrees of two different things And that definition. One is willingness, which is I think what we traditionally have measured, like how, how willing, how um, motivated am I to perform, all of those things in traditional um, engagement measurements is really in that willingness. So it's that is my heart and heart and mind and soul in my work. The other side is the ability. And so ability really speaks to, do I have what I need? Do I, you know, all of those things, do I, um, is the path in front of me clear? Am I facing obstacles? And so willing and able to perform to my potential. So this is ultimately at the, at the end of the day, one of the things that I think we've gotten wrong about engagement over, over the years is forgetting that it is ultimately about potential and it's about enabling each individual person to perform up to their capabilities. And so that, that's how I think about it. It's the work of creating a circumstance that maximizes a person's ability and willingness to perform at, at their potential, whatever their ceiling is. Yeah, no, it's great. I think about, you know, you see a lot of different definitions out there and, and this is the first time I've heard you articulate that way. And, uh, and I really like it. Like we always talk about building an environment where people can thrive, but that again is where, you know, they have to have the ability to thrive with the right tools and resources and environment as well. So uh, no, I really do like that. Um, so, you know, now that we have kind of set that base of the table on, on the definition, you know, kind of the topic more specifically on, the, on today's discussion is around building a better foundation. Um, mm -hmm. And we kind of highlight the social contract with employees and what that looks and feels like. So what I wanted to have you is unpack that, kind of give your, your thoughts around what is the social contract, you know, you know, when you talk about foundation from employee engagement, where does it start? What does it look like? And I think this will really kind of lead us to some really good conversations, some really good questions from you know, people that are on the call right now. Uh, and, uh, and kind of that, that intro to the topic more specifically. Sure. Well, I think, so in terms of foundation, what, what I'll, the way that I'll approach this is I'll talk more about I guess I think why we haven't solved this yet or sort of why we're still talking about employee engagement 30 years after we started talking about employee engagement. And I think it's, it's because organizationally you use the word contract. And I think organizations, most employers, most of the people listening here, their employers are, 
we still treat work largely like a contract with the employee as an employer. So we're, you know, we, you know, it's, it's all about, Hey, we pay you a paycheck. You should be returning work product to us. And almost all of our management and HR processes are designed around enforcing that contract, making sure we're getting our money's worth, right? So performance appraisals and job descriptions and policy manuals and all of those things are really about, the organization saying, hey, this is what we're going to get back from you in this contract or else, right? Or else you go be somebody else's problem. Yeah. The, the problem is, is, as you know, as well as anyone, that the data on engagement tells us that what employees need to feel good about working are things like, I got to feel valued and cared for and trusted and, and accepted and embraced and all of these things. Um, which are not contractual in nature, right? These are relational in nature. And so, so what I sort of what I start with when I start thinking or help you try to think better about engagement is we have to stop treating work like a contract because employees don't experience work like a contract. They experience work far more like a relationship. So I know, you know, social contract, I guess, is an interesting way to say that. I would actually refer to that as as even stepping away from contract language, generally speaking, to more of a relationship. It's a healthy relationship, which is a social contract. But if we build the foundation of a healthy relationship so that work feels like that for employees, I think we're, that's, that's really the work. That's the foundation, in my okay. opinion. Yeah, so it's interesting. We talk about you know, employee engagement and we look at you know, the books beside you on the back there, you know, social gravity around the relationships, the performance management side of things. So maybe tell me a little more about kind of, you know, how you, where do you take that foundation, right? Kind of what, sure. what is the next layer? Um, and, and is it those concepts from the book? Are there other things you need to get to before you can make an impact? Sure. Well, I, I think if, if you, if we, if we get to a, a position of starting point of having a mindset around work of understanding that for employees to maximize engagement, work has to feel like a healthy relationship for the employee. So in order for that to happen, we have to be thinking about, when we think about how do we design processes, how do we design how a manager should interact with employees, how do we coach managers, how do we do all of this, it has to be built on a foundation of understanding how do relationships work, how do, how do healthy relationships work. And so it's things like, you know, and no surprise, this is some of the stuff we talk about in engagement, but I don't know that we've understood why it's important. Things like, I, need, I wanna feel appreciated. I want to feel seen. I want to feel valued. And in, in relationship, it's like, what does that look like? How do we do that? And it's about creating these positive moments of recognition. It's about, you know, reinforcing someone's social worth, all of these, you know, things that we've, we've, we know it's important from the data, but we didn't understand necessarily why it's important. It's important in a relational context. The other thing, you know, communication starts to look different or emphasizing support going both directions. The idea of reciprocity you know, that I think we expect employees to be very loyal, but we don't always demonstrate loyalty back to them. In a healthy relationship, it's reciprocal, right? It goes both ways. And so when you start to unpack what a relation, what makes for a healthy relationship, and then you start putting the things we do at work through that filter, that's where the work starts. So like performance management, as an example, if you think about performance appraisals and how awful and terrible that process is, for to, as a as an, both an employee and manager, nobody likes that process. You would never use a process like that with your kids or with your wife or whatever because you love those people. You would never do something so terrible to them. So why do we do that to people at work, right? That's that's kind of the. I think it's pretty simple when we start stepping back and realizing like we're doing a lot of stuff that doesn't build relationship very well. We need to change that. Yeah. So I guess the so I, mean, I like the, the those concepts and if you. If I'm sitting here listening and saying, okay, we'll build that foundation, understanding the concepts of, you know, relationships and some of the processes that go around it, like, where, like, where do I start? Is it, is it alignment around what, what this means in terms of building better relationship with this, this social contract? Like, I'm trying to get, you know, yeah. I'm struggling, where do yep. I start? Yep. So, I, I would say... I. Where I, where I often encourage people to start is to start with kind of the, I think the most central unit of that relationship or sort of the source of the relationship, which we know in most organizations is our relationship with our immediate supervisor. It's like our, our immediate supervisor and our close peers. So uh, if I'm going to feel like I'm in a good relationship at work, I'm going to need to feel like I'm in a decent relationship with those people. And so that requires things like 
you know, I, I think the most powerful tool to drive engagement is the one-on-one -on -one meeting between the, the manager and the employee. And so teaching managers how to, well, first off, requiring managers to be having a one-on-one -on -one with their people at least monthly, um, depending on nature of your work. Um, and then helping them understand how to have a good conversation in those, mm -hmm. that, that alone can, can start to transform how people feel and what that relationship feels like. So like that would be a place to start. I think the second, you know, another idea would be thinking about, okay, where do we commune? Where do we build relationships? So looking at what do we do around team meetings or huddles or when we're together, what does that look like? What does that feel like? Is it very contractual? Is it very one way? Or are we using it to foster relationships? Do we use our team meeting, for example, when I was researching for the book for uh, Unlocking High Performance doing organizational profiles, I was surprised one of the most common things I heard in organizations that really had a healthy, positive culture in this way was that in their team meetings, they had regular meetings with their teams, but they were doing organized shout outs, some kind of like ritualized appreciation was part of almost every meeting structure that I heard about. And so like that would be another place if you're not doing that, that's another place to start to kind of start building that stuff into the, the places that organize or the employees have their most frequent interactions or touch points every day. Yeah. I mean, one of the successful things I've seen in, in, in that rhythm, like you don't have to recreate a strategy. Like what are you together every day? Where do you leverage your current you know, methods and modes of communication to add that level of conversation recognition, whatever you're trying to do. And it's a lot easier than trying to start from the, you know, the ground up from a, from a structure standpoint. Um, so I've seen a lot of companies have success in that. Um, Absolutely. That, one thing I do want to mention to everyone that's on the call right now, and there's, there's a, a lot of us, uh, again, if there are any other questions, things you want to dig into, feel free to, to put that in there. Um, actually, Gabriel just came up with something that we, because we did bring up performance management as one of the, one of the constructs was, uh, Jason, what would you recommend as an alternative to performance appraisals? Um, now that we're getting a little more specific, that's a whole webinar on its own. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, I wrote a whole book on that topic, <laughs> actually. So um, I don't know that I can address that, but, but what I would, uh, you know, in two minutes. But what I would say is um, the key is to step back and really understand that the performance appraisal is a contractual enforcement tool, right? It was, it was a device that was created as a way of enforcing employee output versus the contractual expectation. And so I think the key when we step back from it and say, okay, well, if we're trying to enable performance, if we're trying to create greater willingness and ability to perform at potential, what might that look like? Um, how might that look in the context of a relationship? So it's things like, um, and this is really what I break down in the book, is that it's not, it's not a replacing one process with four or with a different kind of singular event-based process. What it is about is creating a, a system of work that gets the employee what they need to be at their best. And so it's, you know, I basically break it into three buckets, planning, cultivation, and accountability. Planning is sort of clarifying the what, why, and how. So that's really about expectation clarity. Cultivation is about setting an environment that really gets obstacles out of the way and make sure people have what they need. And then accountability is, is really about doing, doing and providing feedback in a way that that is helpful and constructive as opposed to the way that we've done it traditionally. And so it's, it's a set of processes and it's the way that we approach work. So I think you're better setting aside your, your, your appraisal, your annual appraisal, set that aside and, and start thinking more deeply about how do we manage work throughout the year so that employees can be better in every moment and, you know, not think of it as, as a, as a, an event, um, that we're trying to solve. It's, that's not what the issue is, I don't think. Yeah. And I, I want to kind of get back to the leadership conversation. I got super excited seeing a question coming from Gabriel. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it kind of gets to that, like you said, it's not an event or moment in time. But on those kind of leadership one-on-ones, the leadership relationships being really critical to that, that you know, those levels of engagement. Um, we actually just a few months back on this type of webinar series had a uh, an HR leader, a customer of ours, looking at literally correlations to engagements and whether they were actually having one-on -one meetings or not. And what we saw was this dramatic increase in, in that case, it was the NPS that was being measured. But um, yep. just that level is to your point, it's not a moment in time event. It is this relationship, you know, communication over time that 
uh, ended up having a more, more powerful impact. And I, I'm going to ask this because uh, people always ask me, but that concept of people leaving managers, not companies, do you agree with that? Do you not? I, you know, I have, <laughs> I have a love hate relationship with that particular construct because I think, um, I think being a middle manager in corporate America is the hardest, worst job that there is in terms of just because employees blame you for everything and then executives blame you for everything. And so you're stuck in the middle. And then when people leave, you get blamed for people leaving too. And I think it's an easy, lazy way out personally. Yeah. I think managers have an outsized role in engagement, but I don't think it's all on them or shouldn't be all on them. Yeah. Okay. So the, the concept and discussion around one-on-ones and that relation, that kind of, you know, communication and relationship with the manager kind of, kind of bubbled up here. A lot of people have a lot of questions on, um, one was, you know, is there an easy way that you can track this or a tool that you use? And if you're on the webinar, you know, type it in the chat, people can see it. Maybe there's something there. But, um, one of the questions also came in was, you know, you know, monthly one-on-one meetings with a staff of 30, 40 people, like how do you recommend balancing with other expectations and planning. And I mean, you have other, you have a job to do as well, as opposed to sit down for 30 one-on-ones in the course of a month. Uh, I mean, I have my perspective on how I've you know, balanced that, but you know, any thoughts? I'd be curious right? to see what you think of this, but my, my reaction would, would be to say that if you have 30 to 40, if you have 30 to 40 direct reports, your number one priority is to meet with all of those people. And then whatever time you have left over, you can use for the rest of your work. But if you have more work than, than allows you to meet with those people, your organizational structure is broken. Yeah. Like 30 to 40, you can't, maintaining a, a, a high quality relationship with those 30 to 40 people, you could probably do it if that's all you had on your plate. But if your organization is asking you to maintain that plus do your own full-time job, I would argue that um, you're not designed correctly um, and you're, and you're being set up to fail. Either you're going to fail or those people are going to fail, but not everybody's going to win in that environment, at least not win it at what you're fully capable of, because I, I agree that it's, it's a, it's a really impossible situation that person's been put in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've been in a situation where I've been around 20 and the way I structured it was, you know, half hour, for eight hours, I can meet 16 people in two days and try and leave the other half of the week to do other work. Um, but when you start getting to 30, 40, you're right, it's a little challenging. Um, the one thing I've tried to do is, is there anything in a team atmosphere that allows some of those pieces of feedback or things you need to communicate or other items that you could kind of have a shorter one-on-one, -on -one, but um, sometimes the cadence might not be as easy on a weekly basis or bi-weekly, it might have to stay till monthly. Um, yeah, I so think I if you're the single point of if you're the single point of supervision or management for 30 or 40 people, that is not a sustainable, that's not a sustainable model to have a really highly engaged, productive team, I don't think. Yeah. Okay. So I guess when we're talking about this foundation, we talked about the, the relationship part of things and obviously some of the process, anything else that you want to bubble up in terms of kind of uh, what's included in this foundation or where to start as a result of it? Um. Well, I think I, I tend to think, you know, if I, so I, I'll, I put it back on people when I think like if, if, if there's something wrong, let's say, you know, Rob, if you have something in your, a relationship in your personal life and something's not right, what, what would be your first instinct as to what to do? You're gonna to have to repeat it. I was just reading someone else's comment. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, yeah. See, I, you didn't expect you expect me to go talk, and then I totally screwed up the dynamic. No, I love. I was it. just this saying, like, about being real. If, if you if you had a relationship in your personal life, a personal relationship, and you felt like it wasn't going well or something wasn't right, what would be your first instinct as to what to do? Hey, dedicate time to it. Fix it. Go talk to them. Right. Yeah. I mean, go ask them. And I think that's a that's something that we overlook here is that we we're not spending as much time back to relationships when we think about, you know, if we want to have a better relationship with employees, it requires a lot more communication. It requires a lot more dedicated time, you know, and this is why like employee voice, I think has gotten to be a big deal, but it's not just asking, it's truly listening. It's asking better questions. It's asking, you know, um, really being in those conversations. So if you want it, teaching managers to have better conversations, teaching employees to have better conversations with each other, asking, you know, how to have good, I'll call it feedback conversations or just conversations in general. But I think, I think we have to understand that communication and especially that one-to-one -one communication 
Um, but, but asking and listening and acting like that's super important. And so as a foundation, that's something you need to get really good at. Yeah. Then the reason why I got sidetracked reading was I really like what Kevin wrote. We said to me, relationships been with mutual understanding and mutual expectation. Um, so there has been situations where maybe the one on one wasn't feasible, but there was an open understanding and expectation that at any moment in time, you could call me out of hours. You could have this conversation, walk into, not that we had offices, but just to like come up and have that discussion. So I do think it's outside of the structure of it, that mutual understanding and expectation, I think is really interesting. Yeah, um, agreed. So one thing that uh, you did mention was the employee voice world. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm super close to that as well in terms of hearing the voice of employees to understand engagement or build that kind of you know, social contract. Um, but we actually had a few folks that were, uh, that when they registered, asked a couple of questions as well. And when you brought that up, one of them was around this concept of employee voice. And, and the question said, you know, we're all challenged at times to orchestrate an open dialogue with so many different personalities. Um, and I think this ties into the relationship discussion. Um, you know, we use tools to get feedback, but we rarely receive feedback that is constructive for us to improve on things. So how do you deal with employee personalities or backgrounds that they're just, they're uninterested in giving feedback? Like they're, it's not something that they want to provide. And, but also it seems like it's, um, it's rarely, a f a f rarely receiving feedback that's constructive. I, so I don't think, and this is a huge leap um, in hearing that, but in my experience, when I hear a situation like that, where you've got the organization saying, well, people won't even tell us, we ask them, but people won't tell us, won't give us feedback, won't give us constructive feedback. That's not a feedback problem and it's not an employee problem, it's a trust problem. And so the reason they won't give you constructive feedback is either number one, they don't trust you with it, or they don't think you're going to do anything with it if they do give it to you. That, that is what's going on. And so what, what you have is not a, a question or a voice issue. What you have is a trust issue. And to address that, you've got to find ways to start reestablishing trust, to reestablish the fact that, no, we really do we really do value your opinion. We want to hear it. And when, when you tell us something, we're going to hear it. We're going to take some action on it to do something. And my guess is they've had some kind of breakdown in that cycle in the past where they probably got feedback. People have told them the truth. Nothing happened or they perceived that nothing happened. So they're like, why bother? Yeah. Why bother? Or they've gotten burned by feedback coming back on them somehow in a bad way. And so that's a trust issue that needs to be addressed. It's probably not a feedback problem. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Uh, even some color and you know, helping a lot of companies in this day to day as well is uh, I usually find that there's two types of feedback. Like if we're just asking people if they're satisfied or not, that's interesting, right. but it's not going to give you anything that's, you know, a constructive or what you can use. And the yep. other kind of employee voice is participative management. So tell us what you would recommend us do. It's, yep. it's not about just giving the feedback, but what would they do differently? How would they change your process? And I find that's a really good way to get constructive feedback. And it's kind of the, yeah. the open-ended discussion. Um, yep. And then the other question people have as well, we may not be able to do that on a one-on-one -on -one or a focus group. People won't come out with it. So then the choice is, do you want to have anonymous or non-anonymous feedback? And, sure. and there might be avenues for both uh, in the organization to try and address that. Uh, yep. Um, I, I agree. So what's interesting is, uh, and I kind of want to move off of the kind of one-on-one -on -one side of things, but what was interesting is outside of one-on-ones or, you know, when I think about holistically, you're talking about this relationship and this, this social contract. Um, Shannon had a, a comment here that said, what are some strategies for very large workforces of mostly, let's say either unionized or frontline employees? It's non-office environment. You can't do one-on-ones very, you know, it's not very feasible. Um, any experiences, Jason? I know you work with a lot of organizations that are in those types of environments. Um, you know, I think it's, I, I, I tend to go back to the basics, right? It, the basics of foundational um, the foundational components of, of what builds a healthy relationship or constitutes a health, healthy relationship and then thinking about how can we do this at scale for everybody. So it's things like, you know, when we think about appreciation and value, like there's, you know, what kinds of programs, what kinds of communication, what kinds of, um, you know, even just what, what kinds of things can we distribute to help managers or help anyone, help employees start to, to more freely and readily share appreciation with each other? How do we teach people to do that? Or how do we encourage that? How do we provide tools that make that easier? So like, because appreciation is so core to a healthy relationship or communication, right? I, I would venture to say that I've never seen 
an organization of any size that is communicating perfectly or as much as employees would like them to communicate. So finding ways to um, address communication gaps. And, and when I say address communication gap, it's not just about pushing more information out, but I think in, in the, for purposes of engagement and relationship, we communicate, when we're thinking about it as communicators in organizations or as managers, what we should be thinking about is, how do I reduce the level of uncertainty for that employee? Like that's what communication's purpose is, to reduce uncertainty, create greater clarity. And so, you know, whether it's union environment or not, like where are, where's the level of uncertainty? And how, what can we do through communication, whether it's one-to-one, -one, whether it's, you know, broadcast, whether it's webinar, whatever that is, how do we, how can we address the things that are creating greatest uncertainty and reduce that uncertainty, create greater clarity that will strengthen the relationship? Um, so, I mean, there's, those are the kinds of things like think start by thinking very fundamentally about some of these big things that go towards um, go towards relationship building that are important at all levels of relationship one on one or one to many and start there. Uh, and I haven't heard it framed that way and I really liked it. I mean, if I think about you know, what is the goal? Yeah, reduce uncertainty. No one wants to be in that uncertain environment. It's not healthy for a social contract um, uh, or an engaged employee. Um, I'm going to make a connection here because there was a question here around who owns this concept of engagement of that social contract. And there was another question about, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't approach it from an HR perspective. I'm actually in the internal communications world, you know, and is there anything that we can do differently or you've seen differently where internal communications could have a different role from an HR perspective. And I have a thought on this as well, but um, it's interesting, those two concepts, I want to blend together to a not very clear question for you. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I think, I, I think one of our challenges from an engagement, you know, if, if we're really about creating an engaged environment, if we're, if we want to maximize the degree to which employees feel willing and able to perform at their best, it, it's not owned, like having a, having a debate about who owns it is non-productive. Having a debate over who's going to buy and administer the survey, fine, I don't care who that is. It can be communication, it can be HR, it can be whatever, like somebody should do that. But I think engagement, the way that we, when we usually start you know, arguing over this kind of thing, it's more about who's gonna administer the survey and I really don't, I mean, as long, and, and whoever administers the survey should be including all voices in that process regardless. So I think it makes sense for sometimes communication to have it. It makes sense for HR to have it. It can make sense for an OD group to have it. I don't, it doesn't matter because that person basically just has to carry the shoulder of the work or the load of the work to, to engage you know, all the leadership and everybody else and making sure that we have a process that's not only valuable, but drives action and makes things better. I think when we, when we step back from engagement and recognize that engagement is this output of the experience of work that employees have every day, nobody can own that by themselves. Like the organization has to create that and design an experience. And I think communication plays a role in that. HR plays in a role in that. Manager, management and leadership plays huge roles. Your fellow employees play a role in that. But I think, you know, like thinking about it from an architecture or design perspective, communication can be a designer, HR can be a designer. Somebody probably can lead that effort, but it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like saying like who owns you know, who owns sales in the organization or who owns marketing? Well, it's like there's a group that owns kind of the, the structural and strategy piece, but like sales happens all over the place or is impacted by everybody in the organization on some level. Um, and so I think we need to be thinking about it that way here too. Like functionally, who's going to take different steps in the process makes sense. But I think saying who somebody owns engagement is counterproductive because it lets somebody else say, okay, that's not my problem. And you definitely don't want managers thinking it's not their issue to own. Yeah. There's a comment here. I hear a lot about the manager, but what about, you know, self-directed teams? So to your point, engagement is kind of, it's a holistic world there. But I think um, what I keep hearing in organizations, especially it sits on HR shoulders, but how do they not how do they be the enabler, basically? How do you enable different parts of the organization or those, or those leaders to have better tools and kind of what your definition of engagement in the first place was? Yeah. Um, but uh, there is a lot of debate on, on that end and, and some of the comments that are coming in. Um, okay. one, uh, 
You mentioned the word experience, and, and I don't know if we're going to go here or not today, but um, you know, a lot of the conversation is employee engagement, employee experience. Is it the same thing? Is it different? Um, I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> yeah, so I'll give you my like one minute on this is that I, I know a lot of people sort of are, are treating it like it's the same thing or it's a new name, new branding, because we do that in HR all the time. We take, you know, we take employment, make it recruiting, and we take recruiting and make it talent acquisition. It's the same thing with a new name. I don't think that's what's going on here. In, it, engagement is an outcome measurement. Experience is something that happens and we, you know, the employee actually is in every day. I think experience is something we can design and we can create. And that experience creates engagement. And so they're not, they are, they are certainly linked, but they are not the same. And I think experience actually is kind of the, the thinking that we've been waiting for to break us, break us free or to break us open on engagement because it moves us up into a proactive mindset where we start to think about how can we design a workplace for engagement as opposed to how do we measure our workplace to see how engaged we are and then go back and try to fix, fix the brokenness, which is what the traditional model has largely been built around. I think this moves us up into a proactive position. So I think it's really positive, but it's a different way of approaching the work. Okay. It's probably more than a minute, sorry. No, I was actually, I counted, it was 60 seconds on the dot. I'm kidding, I didn't. Um, so, you know, so these are good questions coming in and, and, you know, I feel like a lot of people are really engaged. We're not going to get to all of them, unfortunately. But um, one of the things that really caught my eye, and, and I don't know who Ryan is that typed this, but what, call it whatever you want, call it engagement experience, but how do you sell this concept uh, to convince a CEO that may not see that return or understand the benefits of it. And, you know, I think, you know, we're always waving the same flag. I think a lot of us on the call are sold. We get the understanding of yeah. why it's important, but like in your experience, Jason, have you had to go down that approach? Is there a good kind of mindset or tactical way to go about it in terms of getting that, you know, I call it executive buy-in that, that may not see it. Yeah. I, so two, two different things I'll offer up is potential. I mean, every, Every executive group is different in terms of what their hot buttons are. But what, what I have found, there's sort of two things. One is, you, and, and you hear this in my language, I kind of, I think this is where it came from, was beating my head against executive walls over the years. But if you're going to talk about engagement, you had better be talking about performance. Um, because performance is the imperative of any organization. We exist to perform. And so if you can't tie and explain how your engagement efforts, whatever it is you want to do, are going to improve and impact employee performance or organizational performance, you might as well not bother, right? Go back until you can figure that out and draw that linkage and explain that linkage. Um, and that's why my definition explicitly ties back to, this is about helping employees perform better. That's why we're doing this. Otherwise, who cares? Like, I mean, at the, from an executive level, being very like cynical, like that's how I, that's how I, you have to kind of have that in the back of your mind. I think the other thing is, one of the one of the benefits that's uh, uh, that's been happening is that we've, you know, if you look to the world of t two different places, one is um, customer experience design. Executives have been thinking about reading about knowing about customer experience for a while. When you can talk to them about customer experience and explain, like, well, why do we spend so much time? thinking about how we want customers to feel or the experience we want them to have through our buying cycle or whatever, what it, pick, pick, whatever that is. And then connect like, okay, the same dynamics are at play here. Like we, you know, we want a certain outcome there. So we design this experience and then we measure how we're doing. The same thing over here. We want certain output from employees. We should be designing that experience and measuring how it's doing um, to get that output. Um, the other place that experience is showing up is in software, right? If, if you have, if your company has anything to do with software or, you know, customer interface or website, user experience design has, is really well developed, or at least is pretty well developed. And if they've heard any conversation about that, you can use that also to help them understand and think about, you know, we're designing an experience for employees that more naturally guides them towards performing better. And so when you can start talking, anchoring the work that we want to do in concepts from other parts of the business that they already accept to be true and they're probably already investing in and ultimately point it back to performance, I think that's, 
to me, that's what I have found to be a fairly compelling argument because now you're not talking about happiness or well-being or discretionary effort, which they're not really sure what that, what that means. We're starting to talk about it in terms that matter to them and that connect back to bottom line. And I think that's, that's what we have to be doing. I mean, not that well-being and happiness and all, we know that matters. They don't think it matters. And so don't go in with a business case that they've already dismissed. Yeah, maybe to double click on that, when I, um, I've had a couple of visuals that I found really helped in that realm. Um, and it was t literally taking the concepts of what do we do from a consumer perspective, right? We try to engage our consumers. We try to listen to them. We try to make sure they never leave us through loyalty programs. There's all these elements what we do, but if we take the constructs of how we look at our customers and relate that to talent, now you can start seeing that picture that you're painting there, Jason. Um, and in fact, you start looking at the numbers around it. I think the latest Gardner research, I said people, companies are spending 11 times more on say customer systems than they are on the employee systems. And reality wise, I mean, customer happiness, you know, shareholder value, those are all outputs, right? All you can control yeah. are the inputs of what employees are doing every day. So um, I, I found those visuals to be really powerful to your point about relating this to something that they're investing a lot of time and effort already, which is an experience for those other people outside right. the four walls of the company. Yep, absolutely. Um, I realize I said double click, and I think that makes me sound a little old. Um, hopefully <laughs> people know. on this call understand what double clicking is. Um, we, we had a conversation earlier, Jason and I, I right, right before this about the, uh, what was it, the double space? Yeah, you said, does double click make you old? And I said, no, but you know, double spaces do make you old. I think there's no debate on that. I'm in that bucket. <laughs> Yeah, I've been called out for the double space. If anyone in the comments or Q&A want to put a double space after your period and next sentence, please feel free to. You will not get... Uh, no judgment here. Yeah, zero judgment uh, <laughs> from that perspective. Um, so, you know, you've, you've done a lot in terms of, obviously, the research, the, the writing, but a lot of consulting with organizations. And, and we talked about kind of that ownership of engagement. And, and the one question that came up on, from the, the, the you know, who, people on the call was, you know, what are your thoughts to allocating a de dedicated staff, a couple of employees who that's all they do, coordinate employee engagement activities across the enterprise with HR, which internal comm, like they are the employee engagement department, so to speak. I, if you can get the resources, get the resources. I think the key is to make sure that you, you know, you have a strategy in place for how you're deploying and using those resources um, that you, that points back to enabling organizational performance or outcomes or strategic um, objectives because I think what happens sometimes is you get you know you get those teams and we end up pointing at things that we know matter we get you know wrapped up in kind of the activity of of employee engagement whatever you want to call that and if the executives are looking at that and they're not making you're not constantly connecting the dots for them as to how what we're doing here is actually enabling and driving performance or is you know helping lift the boat, then the first moment they have to to budget cut, it'll become an easy thing to to throw on the the scrap heap. And so I, I would always take resources. I was always like, if you want to give me resources, I will turn it into value uh, when I was on the inside. But I think you you have to be very clear about what the strategy is, um, how we are driving engagement, why it matters, what specific things we're doing to enable. Um, and really thinking about amplifying effect. I think the key is not, you know, being the people doing all the work, but you should be out, your job should be out. Like, how do we, how are we out enabling others to create the kind of experience that engages and lifts everybody's up? up? So you're kind of an amplifier and enabler. If you do that the right way, I think it's an awesome use of, of resources. Okay. I would never turn it down. <laughs> yeah, like jump on that if you get the opportunity. Yeah. Um, okay, so a lot of comments and things coming in. I'm trying to kind of put them in a place where we're, you know, sticking on track and not deviating too much. But one thing that comes up in the social contract of, of engagement uh, was an interesting question from Diana. It said, you know, what if you do have communication and trust, but you want to engage people more? Kind of, and she put engage in quotes. Um, you want to make them feel valued, it, like it's a great place to work, connect them to the culture more. Anything, any recommendation, Jason, in terms of, you know, you do have communication and trust, that relationship's there, but what can you do to engage people more? Um, I like how you get all the hard questions, by the way. Yeah, I was going to say, so, so the, the, just to be clear, she's saying you do have trust, 
yeah, good communication, but you still want to engage people more. Like, is it what's kind of what's next after those table stakes? So to speak? got it, got it. Um, well, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of that depends on what is what is your organization, what do your employees need, and this is the design piece of it. Is that if you if you are clear on you know, your intention of like, we want to create an experience of work that's going to feel really good to people um, so that they can perform better, right? So that they can bring more. Um, I think the next step, if they, you know, if you've got good communication trust, then go engage with them, right? Do some, at least this is always my advice, like go ask people, go do some focus groups or some open space events or, or, you know, you can start with a survey, do a survey and then use that to go do more specific conversations with employees have managers have conversations with employees about like what do you need um what kinds of things could we do let's start experimenting and trying some different things and so <clears throat> i don't think there's a i my i've not seen it yet i mean there's some things if you're doing in you know communication broadly well and you've got some good you know the good tools and kind of the right mindset in place broadly the rest of the work is is kind of boots on the ground like you've got to be out with people talking to them and and helping understand what they need what they need at a team level and trying to create and manifest that with them and for them in order to make progress so it's not a shortcut but it's pretty effective yeah i think uh no i like that i mean if, if you have that feeling where things are going well there's always a level of continuous improvement there and, and sure that not everyone's experience is perfect so just having those discussions um you already have the trust there, so they're going to be open about, you know, what what is right. possible or what the what the you know improvements can look and feel like. So um, I think it's a good position to be in <laughs> at the end of yeah, the day. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, well, you know, I, being cognizant of time, we have about twelve minutes left. We have a ton of questions, and you know, I, I don't think we're going to realistically get to them all. So um, you know, I, I want to leave some conversation at the end for some you know, specific prescriptive type things and recommendations you might have. So we'll get there. Um, but one thing that I actually just a question that came up, which is yeah, something we've been reading a little more about in, you know, uh, social media or in the news was this concept of the four day work week. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and, and Agnes, you know, there's more and more scientific evidence gathered that it's a positive impact on productivity, which is what we want at the end of the day. Um, and Jason, what's your view on that from, from an employee engagement perspective? I, so, I, you know, from an employee engage, engagement perspective, I don't know that it's a, I, I kind of have a neutral perspective other than four day work week sounds interesting. There was just also an article out what last week that Microsoft was piloting. I think, I don't remember where it was, but they piloted a 30 hour work week and found that productivity actually went up overall by having employees work less hours. And so it's not just about like when we go from five day to four day, it's still a contractual thing because we're still talking about hours often. Um, so I think, you know, it's still like, well, it's instead of, instead of eight hours over five days, it's 10 hours over four days is still, it's still contractual thinking. And so in a lot, unless we're, you know, and sometimes you got, you know, I understand that there are jobs where it actually is hours and we got to have coverage, but um, we still have to be like, regardless of how many days you're working or what your shift is or any of that, it still has to feel like a healthy relationship. We still have to be delivering on that promise for the employee. Yeah. So I don't know that 10 hours days is better than eight hour days or that 40 hour weeks are better than 30 hour weeks. I know people who work a lot of hours that are super engaged and love their work. And I know people that work short schedules and hate where they work. And so I don't think it's, I don't think it's as simple as scheduling and fixing it. It probably would make some people happier and other people unhappier. I think it's, there's a much broader, um, conversation that has to be had around that. So I don't know, I don't have an, like an employee engagement perspective, I guess, hard one on that and that I don't, it won't solve it, I guess. Yeah, I think what you said really resonated. Like you could change that tomorrow in your organization, but like, are people gonna feel more engaged? I mean, some people may think they have spare time to do something outside your office, but people, you know, may not have a structure that works for them. Um, yeah, I do like the idea of if you relate it back to that idea of now you have a contract to work 30 hours versus 40 hours, it still right. doesn't change whether, you know, that social contract exists or those, those relationships are healthy. Yep. Um, 
So, you know, I guess uh, we'll get to some of the other questions here, but, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, I've kind of followed some of your work and, and some of the stuff you've done, but I know you do some discussions around this concept of hacking uh, employee engagement. And, um, and I just wanted to get your, you know, any thoughts on that you think might be valuable to the people on the call, this concept of hacking. Is it a prescriptive thing that you could do? Is it a mindset? Um, yeah, something we can take away. So it is, um, I, yeah, I teach a... I teach a process for hacking that is a very simple process. We use it a lot of time. We'll go into organizations and do kind of a hackathon to tackle things. And I'll teach this as a way to approach things. But in short, what hacking is, if you, if you, if you think about how computer hackers do what they do, and this is, can be good or bad, it's not necessarily good or bad, but what they do is they go into code like a, a string of code and they identify a, a short part of that code that they can manipulate to try to make the whole program do something different. And so it's about identifying small changes they can make to have fairly sizable impact on the outcome of whatever the process is. And so when we talk about hacking engagement, what that means is, is rather than trying to think about how do we solve that, like, you know, even the questions that have come through today are really big questions, right? They're about, is it who owns it up here? And it's these big kind of broad processes. We get stuck in that. And those, are, and, and those are good problems to wrestle with. But what hacking says is that, listen, when we get a, when something surfaces and we hear that like we have a team trust issue, I don't trust the people that I work with, let's say comes up on our survey as an issue. Boy, that's a big thing to think about. Hacking means, okay, well, let's take that problem and let's start breaking it down into identifying all the different things that could be going on in there or all the different components that lead to tr team trust, right? It could be expectations. It could be the manager, um, the manager's behavior. It could be the kind of people on the team. It could be um, the way we meet. It could be all these different things, breaking down all those things and then identifying one thing that you could take and start experimenting with and making some changes to and take some action and try it see what happens see what see if it fixes it if it doesn't throw it out try something else but overall the idea in hacking is just taking a bigger a bigger problem or system and breaking it into smaller pieces to find something that you can take action on now it's like if you if you have like leadership trust comes up on all sorts of of survey you see it all the time leadership trust or communication is always an issue well, you can't just like wave a, wave a magic wand and fix that, right? And that's a long fix. So it's like, what could we do right now? What's a small change we could make right now that would have an impact? Let's do that. And then let's find another one next and another one next. That's the magic of hacking is break it down, find a small thing you can take action on and then go. Yeah, and no, I really like that message. I mean, I find like people want to talk about, we need to change our performance management structure. And it's like, yeah. it's so big tied to so many things and contracts around comp and you name it. And it's like, yeah. then you become this, you just sit there, right? Nothing gets done, nothing changes, but being able to like fix or focus on that one part, I think is a really good framing and, and, and thought process that I, I hadn't really thought about. Uh, and it's a good way to structure it. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so I guess the, you know, as we round up in the last kind of five minutes here, what's one last thing you would recommend to people to, again, you know, uh, build that foundation or, or change that social contract uh, as a takeaway for everyone here? Um, it's a good question. Uh, what haven't we covered? Uh, I think, and I keep coming back to this over and over, every time I, I, you know, I find, I'll give you just a quick example. I had a client that I'm working with, a new client, and um, one of the things they were asking me is, I'd done some training with them and then they asked me to help them solve kind of a problem. They said, listen, we, we have a, an objective organizationally to our CEO who said he wants to build a leadership culture. I said, and we need you to help us figure out how can we measure that? Like, what are some measures we could use to measure that? And I said, okay, great. What is a leadership culture? And there was just sort of a, like a blank stare back at me at the time. Not, not a blank stare, but they're like, okay, yeah, that's a good question. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to build you a measure without you being able to tell me what this looks like or what it means. And so I think the the regardless of what it is you're trying to accomplish in employee engagement, be very clear about like, I, I think just using the phrase employee engagement isn't even all that helpful internally. It's like, why do you, 
Why do you want engagement? And what does engagement mean at your organization? What will engagement do when you achieve it? And tell that story. Get really clear about what it is you're trying to do and stop talking in abstracts. Like we talk, we use these terms that make sense to us or we think that they do. But when somebody says to you, when your executive goes, okay, fine, engagement, I've been, I've been hearing you talk about this. What does that mean and why do we care? You would better be able to answer that really clearly in a way that they care about or, you, or you, you're losing. And so spend time on that. I know it feels unproductive sometimes, but spend some time getting really clear on, on the what and the why behind the work that you're doing. Because if you do that, it'll propel everything else. Everything else will be on a, a more solid foundation then. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like defining what success looks like, right? If it's, what, you know, it's kind of the benefit of planning, right? You define what it's going to look like and then you execute your way there. But to your point, if it's not clear what success is and it's abstract, then that road is messy and, and it's really hard to, to be on a path to success, uh, especially when you can't decide what that is. I was also going to ask you what people should avoid. Like what is, um, again, like a landmine to avoid going through this process. And maybe you might've answered it with that last question of like, just avoid coming in with this abstract with any other thought to that uh, now that it's out there. I, I, and I can say this in front of you because I know how you think about your work, but technology is never the solution. Technology is a tool, but if you think that just dropping a technology, a piece of technology in is going to solve your people problem, it will always backfire on you. And so make sure you're clear on what you're trying to accomplish and then go find a great piece of technology like yours or somebody else that can help you accomplish it. But be clear about what you're trying to solve first because throwing technology at it will rarely ever solve a, a people problem. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've like, I've been part of HR technology companies for almost two decades and I start most of my conversations with technologies and enabler. Like yeah. at the end of the day, kind of to your first point, if you can't define what success looks like and technology can't help you get there, then don't bother at the end right. of the day. So no, those are really good two kind of uh, food for thoughts there. Um, and I guess since we have a couple more minutes left, one, uh, one comment or question from uh, someone on the call caught my eye. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's maybe unrelated, but um, does a social contract differ for different generations or is that whole theory exaggerated? And I wonder if you had any thoughts on, on that. I mean, I, I haven't really thought about that. Um, we see different engagement levels at different generational levels um, and you see that consistently. But when you think about the social contract, thoughts? I would just reframe that as like, do, do, the way that you have a relationship is that different for young people versus old people versus what year you were born i think there's some things that are very similar across regardless generations and i think there certainly are things that are different the way that i communicate with my grandmother is different than the way i communicate with my kids um but I think there's some fundamental, they all want to be loved. They all want to be appreciated. They all want to be heard and seen. And so I think, I think sometimes like I'd move, that's where I just replace social contract and just drop the word relationship in there and see how that feels and try that on in your personal life. And I think that's where you'd find through your own experience that there's like, sure, there's differences in how we should communicate. There's differences in our expectations of one another, but there's also some really core common similarities as well and those are the things we need to make sure we're getting right yeah and maybe this is a good final tie-in to what you said earlier is i spent a lot of years in employee recognition and people always said oh we have an older workforce or a certain generation and it's like the intrinsic motivation of getting recognized whether you're 18 or 81 or whatever it is it's pretty much there now the way you like it publicly right. versus private or access to technology or not it really didn't matter, but it was that core fundamental there. So, um, so yeah, I think when you tie it to, you know, uh, to that concept, I think it, it really, really rings true, right? It's a, it's a relationship. Like regardless and it's of also, I mean, the, the, the flip side of that is that we're also dealing with humans. And so I've also never met two single human beings that are the same or that, had, that do relationships exactly the same, which is also the complexity of the work that we try to do, is that everybody has slightly different expectations. And so we also have to be conscious of that. Like there's some things that are universal, I think universally human, but the way we want it and our expectations are all different. And so we have to be cognizant of the fact that each engagement and experience exists on a, on a unit level. And that unit is the human being level. And that's what makes this hard. 
And that's why we're going to be doing this work and still having these conversations 20 years from now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that's a good way to end off. Are you talking about a social contract? It's not this one contract that exists for every single employee. It is an individualization. It is that trust. It is that relationship that really breeds that engagement, uh, you know, at the individual that translates to teams and leaders and and organizations. And and that's where people see a lot of success. So with that being said, Jason, I did want to again say thank you for your time, uh, your insights, uh, and, and really appreciate it. I know you're, you're a busy man. Uh, to all the folks that were on the call, and over 100 still on here, um, really appreciate spending your time to be with us, ask some questions. And uh, if we didn't get your questions, apologies. Uh, there's a lot of uh, engagement uh, here today, pardon the pun. Uh, and uh, we know, again, we're, we'll hopefully we'll be doing our, our next one uh, in the new year um, as we kind of let the busy holidays uh, take hold of the next six weeks of many of our lives. Uh, but, uh, but again, thank you to all that was involved and have a good rest of the day. Take care.